I'm going to put this up and give them uh, all the credit in the world because this would not be possible uh, without them. And so especially, you know, when we think about the fact that with less than two weeks notice, we decided to go uh, from uh, uh, from physical uh, to, to virtual. And so I want to recognize all of our sponsors, 100% of whom who stayed with us uh, even after we decided to go virtual. So at the top, we'll start in uh, Warner Media. Uh, at the gold level, my home department and my home college, my home department, the Kennesaw State University Department of Information Systems, that is in the uh, Michael J. Coles College of Business, uh, have, have stayed with us and have been great to work with. Uh, additionally, we have Bishop Fox, Coal Fire, uh, Genuine Parts, and uh, NCR. Uh, at the crystal level, Crystal, uh, crystal Path, sorry, Critical Path and uh, Synopsis. At the silver level, uh, Aaron's, and you may have just heard from a couple of their employees, maybe not, I don't know, I don't know if they were here in official capacity or not, but allegedly they might know something about Aaron's. Um, next, uh, Binary Defense. Uh, we also have uh, Black Hills Information Security, CoreLight, and GuidePoint Security. At the bronze level, uh, we want to thank NCC Group for coming in to help us at that level. Also want to acknowledge uh, some in-kind sponsors. Uh, EC Council ran some uh, paid training for us yesterday, and some of you took advantage of that, and I've heard really good things about that yesterday. Also want to take a moment to acknowledge uh, Secure Code Warrior. They uh, stood up and are conducting, I think until 4 o'clock, a CTF over in the CTF channel. And so that's been going like gangbusters all day long. A lot of traffic uh, in, the, in the Slack channel for that. Uh, we'd also like to thank the following individuals and organizations for contributing to our raffle prize effort. I uh, want to thank Mike Costa with uh, Crosshair Information Technology. We want to thank Joe Gray. We also want to thank the good folks at Offensive Security. And we also want to thank uh, the pen tester lab for all of the things that they contributed to allow us to have a great giveaway program that's going on all day. Um, if you haven't done it yet, uh, we are a virtual conference and uh, for the first time ever for us, and we have created a map that would allow you to uh, drop a pin in it to let us know where you are. And uh, if you haven't done that already, uh, I've just posted a link to, to be able to do that in, in the channel. Please take a minute and drop a pin. We are truly, if that data that's in the map is, is accurate, uh, we are truly uh, global. I saw somebody check in from Australia. I've seen some folks check in uh, from Germany, from uh, the EU, uh, uh, Greece. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's just amazing to see all these folks. Uh, I also mentioned, uh, I did mention a, a minute ago uh, that we've got uh, those giveaways and prizes to check that out. I'm posting uh, the link to the channel there here in our channel. Uh, you got to register to win. And so uh, for those of you who are privacy adverse, uh, if you want to win, you got to give us real details, unfortunately. So we need a real email address, a real telephone number, real mailing address to make sure we can get you whatever it is you win. So uh, make sure that you give us everything there. Uh, what, somebody just put an O face. Who is it? <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, you know, we've had a lot of good talks all day long today, and uh, some of you have been asking, well, you know, what if I miss one? Uh, how, how can I go about finding it? Well, we're recording all of them, and we are having them processed by a, uh, by a post-production company, and once they are all processed and chopped up in radio, because we've been recording all day long in big blocks, once they are chopped up and ready to go, uh, they will be posted in our YouTube channel. Channel, and I am posting a link to the YouTube channel uh, in, in our channel here. Uh, if you would, go give us a follow on YouTube because when we get to uh, 100 or more followers, we get to change to a fancy, uh, fancy vanity URL, which will, be, uh, which will be good for us. Um, it is now a little after 3.30. Sorry, Jake, I took two minutes of your time, so I'm going to stop yapping. Uh, and please allow me to introduce Jake Williams, our next speaker. Jake will be talking about cybersecurity merger and acquisition due diligence. So let me stop sharing my screen so that Jake can share his screen. Jake, it is all yours, buddy. Take it away. So um, we'll uh, go through over the next, uh, I don't know, half an, half an hour, actually less than half an hour, 25 minutes here. Um, 
Uh, we're going to walk through uh, basically what is uh, cybersecurity M&A due diligence, why do we do it, how do we do it, um, and uh, give you a couple of case studies, and then we'll be, uh, we'll be rocking and rolling. So uh, that said, uh, let's get in. Who am I? I'm not going to belabor this too much. Either you know me or you don't, uh, and you can go back and find this anyway. Um, I work with Rendition InfoSec uh, out in Augusta, Georgia, right down the road from Atlanta, although now that this is a virtual conference, uh, you know, we're, an, we're a international firm. We actually have people permanently in other countries um, and, uh, you know, other countries outside of the U.S. Um, so uh, boutique information security consulting firm do a lot of this merger and acquisition due diligence and want to uh, basically wanted to share some of our experiences with that and, and why it's important to get you thinking about it uh, as a uh, possible activity that you may either want to engage in uh, yourself or uh, engage in yourselves or uh, certainly at least think about bringing somebody in to do. So um, agenda, uh, why it matters, uh, what are the techniques for it, what are the challenges around it, and oh buddy, are there some challenges, and then we'll wrap it up, uh, basically wrap it up for the day. So, um, you know, we talk about why does cybersecurity due diligence matter, and I'm not going to, uh, not going to kick somebody while they're down, uh, certainly, uh, you know, with the COVID-19 scare, um, you know, the uh, hotel industry has been taking a beating, um, and uh, Marriott is definitely my case study here, right? Uh, you may remember last year, uh, Marriott announced a breach, um, and the breach itself came from Starwood. Uh, Starwood is, is Sheraton and a bunch of other brands uh, that Marriott bought, um, and they literally bought a breach. They, they brought on the liabilities with those assets, right? Um, and so we talk about why does cybersecurity due, due diligence matter? Because when an organization is acquired, all the assets get transferred, but of course, so do the liabilities. And if you think about how normal due diligence works, a normal M&A due diligence, taking cybersecurity out of it, nobody goes through and buys, you don't like look at paper and they're like, we attest that we have the following number of buildings and the, the following uh, state of, of these buildings, et cetera. Nobody does that, that that's just ridiculous, right? Um, and so when we step back, I mean, they always send auditors out to like look at the condition of the buildings, to look at the physical stock. If you're buying a uh, buying a warehouse, for instance, right? What is the actual stock on hand, right? Are the factories in shape? If you're manufacturing any massive upgrades, and for some reason, the state of organization's cybersecurity posture isn't given the same level of attention, even though we know now with CCPA, um, the California Consumer Privacy Act (GDPR), uh, numerous regulate, you know, basically uh, numerous regulations around data uh, and data security. Uh, certainly, there's huge liabilities there. Not to mention the brand damage. Uh, that can come from uh, literally buying a breach, right? So, so this obviously matters. Uh, a lot of it is really, uh, you know, propping that value or, you know, communicating that value proposition uh, to chief counsel, chief risk officers, right? Uh, typically the COOs, right? Chief ops officers, CEOs, et cetera, they listen to your chief risk officers, which are typically attorneys, uh, typically lawyers, right? And those chief risk officers will absolutely tell you they don't want to be involved in something like this. And they'll explain the risk very well. It's a matter of you getting with the CRO to get it going. So what's one of the big problems that we run into? Heterogeneous networks. Every M&A, almost every M&A in the last two decades has involved heterogeneous technologies. What Active Directory version are you on? And if you can't answer this question, by the way, this is a big one, right? Are you on a functional level 2008 R2 domain? I can't tell you how often folks come back and like, yeah, our domain controllers are a server of 2016. And I'm like, that's not which AD version you're on, right? You're telling me that the version of your server, it's almost like saying, which version of SSH are you running, right? Um, and you're like, uh, yeah, I'm on Red Hat, right? Well, those two things are, are both technical terms, but they don't actually mean anything together in context, right? Which Linux builds do you have? You have a bunch of engineers that know Ubuntu and the uh, other organizations you're acquiring is all Red Hat, uh, which workstation versions, right? What about VPN and remote access technologies? Oh, buddy, has this been an issue recently, right? And we have a lot of this stuff that isn't considered pre-acquisition. And, and we don't look at how is the newly acquired network going to be secured and monitored, right? Um, you may not be able to, and I'll give you a great example here. I'm not pooping on any vendors. I wanna be super clear about that. I'm absolutely not doing that. I mean, maybe Oracle, right? But, but other than Oracle, we're not gonna like beat up on any vendors, right? Oracle deserves it, by the way. Um, but anyway, uh, let's say you've got CrowdStrike, right? Um, and CrowdStrike uh, you know, is your chosen at, at Bigco, right? The acquiring company, that's your, that's your chosen EDR, right? And CrowdStrike's your chosen, CrowdStrike doesn't run on pre-Windows 7, right? Because it relies on .NET. And if you've got a bunch of technologies, legacy technologies um, in your to be acquired network, obviously we need to secure those and we need to monitor those and simultaneously my chosen tool, right? Can't do it. 
And so this obviously is something I need to consider how I'm going to, uh, how I'm going to bring that together and how I'm going to secure. If we're on a uh, backdated Active Directory versions, I can't just join our domains together, right? Maybe there's a reason you're on a functional level 2008 domain, even though ours is functional level 2016. I may not be, able, it's not as trivial as, as folks like to make it seem. So uh, techniques for cybersecurity M&A, uh, cybersecurity M&A due diligence. How, how do we do it, right? Obviously, this is a problem. I have everybody convinced here because it was easy. This is what you do. You do cybersecurity. You don't want to see this, uh, you know, see this all fall apart, especially because it's going to be your job to go clean it up, right? I, I don't remember who the actual live person is behind the DFIR, DFIR janitor account on Twitter, but I love it, right? DFIR being digital forensics and instant response, and they refer to themselves as a janitor, and I absolutely love it because we are the ones that end up cleaning the pile of poo when poop hits the fan. All right. So we want to make sure that this doesn't, uh, that this isn't an issue um, that we run into. Now, M&A threat hunting is different than traditional threat hunting in literally every way. Traditional threat hunting uses IOCs and baseline deviations. And my friends, I'm here to tell you um, that baselining takes time and it isn't easy. And if you've ever tried to deploy UBA or UEBA software, user environment baseline analytics, or sorry, behavior analytics, um, with minimal false positives, you know this can't be done. Right? There's no such thing as minimal false positives with this. There's less false positives, but what does less mean? Right? Minimal, okay, right? It doesn't happen. Baselines are hard to generate under the best of circumstances, but the reality is that when I'm hopping in to a network where I'm trying to temporarily monitor and temporarily threat hunt around this network, it's just not gonna happen that I'm gonna be able to go generate these baselines. Right? I would love to do it, I just can't. Right? Uh, secondarily, I need, in order to hunt, I'm gonna usually need to go deploy software uh, like endpoint agents, right? And then I need a central server and I need firewall rules to allow these communications. This is not something that's trivial to, uh, to, to accomplish, right? Again, super trivial when you build it out as part of a larger program. I said super trivial. There's no such thing as trivial threat hunting, but it's easier when you build it out as part of a larger program. But doing it temporarily, right, for the purpose of evaluating risk in this network to be purchased, maybe, right, um, it is a super difficult challenge, right? So again, we, we lack baselines, we lack systems for hunting IOCs on endpoints, IOC scanning systems are not easy to deploy. Um, we could try to build baselines, but that gets cost prohibitive, right? These are pre-purchase investigations. This is trying to determine, do we actually want to complete the sale? Now, usually they've already determined a price or at least a tentative price, um, but, but again, there's not a big interest in undertaking huge cybersecurity projects just to determine whether or not that valuation, that price uh, of the organization holds. And so what about tooling, right? You cannot count on the organizations having their own tooling. Typically M&As, uh, you have a big co trying to purchase small co. And, and by the way, there's another third party here called spin co because very often when big co buys small co, they're buying it for a specific piece and spinning off the rest. It is something that they have evaluated that is of interest to them and the rest of it gener interesting or profitable to them. The rest is generally not, and they're gonna spin that off. And so this is another place where I can't count on this smaller co having its own tooling. Even then I may be tasked to look at very specific areas of the network, uh, ideally remain co, right? So, so small co, the piece of it that's remaining versus spin co, they don't really care so much about, right? Because literally they're going to buy a, either buy it and then spin off the chunk or only buy the chunk of it as it's being spun off, right? Getting buy-in for installing agent-based products is problematic. And honestly, most vendors don't license their stuff for this anyway, right? So even going to a lot of your vendors and be like, hey, I, I need to buy 10,000 agents or 1,000 agents and even for 30 days. And they'll look at you like you're, you're nuts. You're absolutely not buying it like that. Um, the vendors that will work with you, uh, typically it's cost prohibitive. It's not very flexible, right? So um, this, is, this is very difficult and it's going to rely on my tooling because I can't count on, I uh, really can't count on the organization having their own. So what do we do? Take nothing else away from this talk. These are the techniques that we use, right? And, and at a very high level and I'm short on time, so we're not going to be able to dive into each one of these in like super detail, right? But I'll walk through and these slides are going to be available afterwards and, and good, right? So we're going to start by reviewing security practices. I want to know at a minimum, what do you have on paper? How do you work? Is there a SEM? And if not, how are logs monitored? And if you tell me that your system admins are going and reviewing logs for security events, I'm calling baloney. The first thing I want to do, right? Calling baloney, depending on where you come from, north or south, sometimes that's calling shenanigans, whatever, right? Bottom line, I'm calling shenanigans. I want to know how are your logs being monitored, right? And if you tell me that your system admins are, tell me that your system admins are monitoring those logs, they're doing log review, 
no problem, right? I pull a couple of system admins into the room, do some interviews, and I just ask, what are you looking for in the logs? And usually I hear words like hackers. And I'm like, what does a hacker look like? I want you to tell it to me like you tell it to my mom, right? My mom is, is, is horrible at tech. She can brick a phone from 30 feet just by looking at it. Um, that's the level of explanation I want. And system admins generally can't provide it. This is not a knock on them, but it does help us evaluate the truth of the statements, right? When they say, yes, we have a log review program, I'm able to go back to my constituent and say, this is what that really meant, right? We reviewed their log review program and wow, does it hurt, right? We wanna know about oddball Unix distros because these are huge support issues. If you've got SCO or HPOX or AIX, right? And, and before anybody's like, none of those still exist, oh brother, let me tell you, right? Legacy systems, again, a lot of my security platforms cannot run on these legacy systems. So simultaneously, my most vulnerable, the population, right? The most vulnerable things in the population, unfortunately, um, we, we can't get good monitoring across them. Attackers know this, they will spend their time embedding themselves there. And as a result, you need to spend time hunting there. Network traffic after an IDS, right? You need to install network taps and collect network traffic, run an IDS, done, right? Um, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this because there's not that much about it, but you're gonna have to bring your own taps, period because almost nobody has them at these smaller company levels. Network traffic capture, right? I wanna identify unmanaged endpoints in the environment. I wanna look at business to business VPNs. They are a huge source of risk for organizations. The big takeaway here, go grab Andy, uh, Andy Greenberg, wrote a great book called Sandworm. Go get a copy of it, it's freaking awesome. And he walks through the NotPetya attacks in Sandworm. Sandworm's about a lot more than NotPetya, but it's an outstanding, uh, outstanding talk there. And he even touches on the business to business VPN side because that is a huge part of how not Petya spread for those B2B VPNs. Then we do vulnerability scanning and I wanna do some of my own vuln scans, right? I wanna see what's, what we're looking at here. What is the overall security posture of the network, right? Now there's a lot of the, there's a lot of extra stuff that we can do here. There's a lot of additional things that we can do. For instance, looking to see, even if something's fully patched today, I can do some quick forensics and these super quick forensics because they have the tooling for it on host to tell when did you get serious about patching because I want to know if you just threw a new coat of paint, right? Uh, or forgive the term here, put lipstick on a pig, right? I need to know that because that's going to tell me, uh, I see a question in the chat there. It's uh, Andy Greenberg, Sandworm is the name of the book, hit it on Amazon. Anyway, um, we want to know if somebody just put lipstick on a pig and kept rolling right on. So triple threat hunting, this is another thing that we do. Look, I can't touch all the hosts here. I don't have that kind of time. It's not a regular threat hunting uh, evolution. And so threat hunting is easiest to start with on the network. And that's gonna help me vector into where to go collect endpoint data. Now there are some high value targets we collect endpoint data from anyway. Memory forensics is the tip top end of that to go hunt down those memory resident threats, right? So you can think about this like the base of a pyramid or network threat hunting across everything. Um, we are then moving into endpoint data uh, on a very limited number of hosts and then memory forensics on onesies, twosies, right? That, that kind of thing. So again, start with the network, move up the stack. Moving forward, residual risk from breaches. A huge percent of breaches, repeat after me, breaches are not completely remediated routinely. Horrible, 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 right? So threat hunting, what I wanna look at here is one, I wanna identify residual malware, but I also want to go in and look at the regulatory liability for improperly reported breaches. This is a huge one for us because we have seen repeatedly where an organization either out of ignorance or malice does not report a breach to the appropriate regulatory authorities. And guess what? When you buy that organization, you bought that liability too. And if they forgot to report or didn't report or whatever, right, you now are stuck with it. You need to go review that yourself and determine with your chief counsel do you think this needs to be done? Is this something that had to have been reported to the regulatory authority? That's something that's absolutely critical uh, to understand. So let's talk about M&A challenges, right? Um, look, uh, the organization under evaluation, they have incentive to be less than completely forthcoming about their cyber hygiene. Now, by law, they absolutely have to, right? In the agreements, they absolutely have to communicate clearly with you. But, oh brother, the people filling out, those pa filling out that uh, M&A paperwork, they are being truthful to the best of their knowledge. And I'm air quoting here, right? Um, I'll tell you that what appears to be deceit in most cases is an extension of existing communication problems between line workers and management, right? If you go into any organization today, forget one that's under M&A, any organization today and you ask management, how's our cybersecurity? They're like, good. And then you go to your practitioners, you're like, 
how's your cyber security? Like horrible kind of thing, right? They know where the bodies are buried. Go talk to your techs, right? I'll tell you another thing is that a lot of folks reduce costs prior to M&A. They try to basically adjust their profit and loss sheet. And what they'll do here is they'll try to cut costs. That comes in the form of software. It comes in the form of services. It comes in the form of staff. And again, uh, at the end of the day, the results here are predictable. InfoSec and IT are cost centers, not profit centers. And you can run with technical debt for a while, whatever a while is, before it catches up to you. You want to know if that's been done. You want to understand the impact of that. Poor asset inventory, another big issue here. All organizations, not just M&A, have issues with asset inventory. But I will tell you, this is a big one for us. It's another reason that we bring in those network taps and start looking east-west. I don't just want to scan endpoints and subnets identified by IT. I want to go find my own. And we do a lot of router config review. We do a lot of firewall configuration review. This helps us find other subnets. We do a lot of passive traffic monitoring, those network taps. And again, we have to bring our own. Now, if you're thinking like, hey, this is an easy thing to get going, I can tell you that we have I, I, incalculable amounts of money at rendition tied up in property um, that is at different you know, network taps and pivot boxes and servers that we can send. You can't send somebody a half rack of equipment and be like, hey, find power space and cooling for this. You have to find portable equipment as well as have your own taps and your software licenses. And it is just maddening the amount of money you have to put into this on the front end. So I just want to throw out here, like on the poor asset inventory side, it is really hard to get this done in the best of times. It is crazy hard to do this um, when you're trying to drop or parachute into an organization and do it uh, for a very temporary time. And then network visibility, right? Again, this is huge for us. Uh, we don't have you know, AV or endpoint protection systems in some cases, or it's just antivirus. Sometimes we don't have a good SEM, we don't have NetFlow, we don't have EDR. This can be super, super difficult to, to get over, right? Um, again, we need to come in and figure out how we can enable the organization or enable us in the context of the organization to threat hunt around those merger and acquisition pieces here, right? And so again, um, the, the bad news, my friends, is you end up having to bring your own beer to the barbecue, right? Um, this is a, uh, this really is, if you want to do this right, and you can do this without doing it right, don't get me wrong, you can still do a little bit of, of work, but to get the best value out of this, you're going to have to bring your own tools, you have to bring your own licenses, your own hardware, et cetera, and there's a lot of considerations that are different. Again, like I mentioned, you know, if, uh, if I'm deploying to an organization normally, I'm bringing rack, you know, basically rack mounted units here, right? Um, doing this, I can't bring rack mounted units, right? I have to bring things that are easy on power space and cooling. Um, I have to bring network taps, uh, you know, again, all kinds of stuff that, that you would think an organization might already have that they do not. I, I just, I'll just throw it out there. You can't count on them having it. Uh, that, that's probably the big one for us is achieving that visibility enough so, so that we can provide the state of the network back to our constituent. So war stories, right? Let's get some war stories going here, right? Michael Bay moments for the win. This one was awesome, right? This is that we forgot about the VMs, right? Um, not the VMs. I had multiple analysts correct me, air quotes, correct me on the report, right? Where they're like, hey, uh, if you could stop capitalizing S and VMs, that would be awesome. I'm like, it would be, but I'm not talking about VMs. I'm talking about freaking VMS. And if you don't know what VMS is, you are in good company because a lot of analysts today don't either. This is literally like backing up into the way back machine, right? I see some comments there, lol, 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 VMS, exactly, right? So our scanning scope was limited due to ICS devices. This is a huge one. This is a big ICS network. We only found this due to on-site interviews and data center visits. I literally walked into a data center and there were, um, yes, Andy, we are absolutely officially old. There is no question there, no question, right? Um, so I walk in and there's an alpha server actually two alpha servers uh, sitting, one of them has the lid off of it, um, sitting in the corner um, of this data center. And I'm like, oh, hey, you guys, uh, you know, not uh, good at taking the trash out, huh? And they're like, oh, that's our uh, parts server, right? Parts server, right? And it used to be, and I kid you not, it used to be their staging server. And now they only have a dev and a prod. They no longer have a staging server because they can't get parts for these. And they literally had to pull the staging server out of production, right? So this is huge, by the way, right? VMS does not run an emulator as a VM, not, not the way they need it to run, my friend, unfortunately, right? So the organization repeatedly tried to move off the legacy VMS servers. They had failed each time, right? This is actually in an alpha. When you talk about emulator, we're talking about an alpha chip here, right? So this, if you don't know what alpha is, uh, drop back, it's deck alpha. Um, they had failed multiple times here, $7 million expense, right? Over three failed attempts. You'd better believe 100%, this is a risk to the organization. It was not disclosed. Um, I'm just gonna tell you, this is, 
yeah, somebody's like, this is why I see 90s motherboards selling for dollars on eBay. Heck yes, right? Absolutely. Let's talk about the B2B VPNs. Initially, I was told there were none. None. Eventually, we found, or quickly found, five always-on VPNs with no filtering, wide open, right? And I'm not going to say target here, but I am, right? Um, target, you may remember, right, was a supply chain attack that the target compromise um, came in through the, uh, uh, basically came in through an HVAC vendor. Huge problem here. Once you put monitoring these VPN connections, it was clear that confidential data was being systematically siphoned from the organization's ERP system from a remote site, right? This is a huge, huge issue. Now, threat hunting alone, I want to be clear, if I go to IOC sweeps, I don't find this, right? We only found this because we were doing good network monitoring. Again, I'm not saying that you only do threat hunting or only do network monitoring. This is a, you have to do it all. You have to bring a lot of stuff together here. It's not easy. It's not always cheap. But man, do we, I can tell you consistently, we save organizations more in their, I will tell you consistently, that we save organizations way more in their valuation than the cost of the actual assessment. By the way, the cost of the assessment is borne by, typically borne by the company to be acquired. And if they have made material misrepresentations in their, uh, material misrepresentations in their, uh, basically their questionnaires and their disclosures, um, typically, uh, you know, there's no refund around if the organization decides to pull out. So this is a no-brainer for Big Co. If you structure this correctly, it's free to you and only reduces the value, right? Um, my final one here is the sure we remediated. During intake, the org said they experienced one major incident, ransomware, in the previous 36 months. 36 months. And I went in and did on-site interviews with staff. And by the way, if you don't know how to interview people slash interrogate, um, take a class on this or find somebody from former law enforcement who knows this and has been trained in this. But I will tell you your best tactic in, uh, in you know, basically doing these interrogations slash uh, interviews is silence. Just go silent and they will review. They will absolutely provide you data and it's awesome. Bottom line, they failed to remediate. We found out about other APT intrusions and done. So this is where I'm out. Uh, as far as wrap it up, these are my conclusion bullets. I don't really have time for a lot of questions here uh, because you know I'm running right up to the end of my time here. But look, seriously, I want to thank uh, you know thank everybody here um, who helped put B sides Atlanta together and everybody who attended. Thanks so much. I'll be posting a copy of these slides. Hit me at malware Jake on Twitter, and I'll post a uh, post a copy there as well as a link in the chat. Uh, thanks, and uh, Andy, I'll kick it back over to you, my friend.